blow on the media whiz, because one art form wasn't enough. And we're here to talk about uh, a recently released movie. I don't really have to be sitting in the car for this, because it wasn't in theaters, but... Hey, let's... let's. I just felt nostalgic, so I was like, eh, gonna talk about a recently released movie. At least do it in the car. That'd be fun. Uh, and since it's the recently released Spongebob movie, I got my old Bold and Brass shirt on. So, yeah, we're talking about Sponge on the Run. So... Sponge on the Run is the recently released Spongebob film. It is the third theatrical movie, even though it wasn't technically theatrical. It, it's the third mainstream Spongebob film. And um, the big gimmick of this one was that it was going to be in CG the entire way through, not like the last one, uh, not Sponge Out of Water, where Sponge Out of Water had the whole element of CG basically near like the end of the film. Um, but it's not like the first one, which was done entirely in 2D animation. This one's entirely CG. And the other gimmick is that it was promoting uh, that new show on Paramount Prime, Camp Coral, one of the many upcoming SpongeBob spinoffs. And, uh, you know, everyone has their own opinion about that, but we're not going to talk about that here. Um, so uh, that was all we knew, really, going in. And, well, uh, I, I rarely try to watch people's reviews of stuff until eventually the movie comes out and then eventually I see it. But I, I cheated this one time. I did see LS Mark's video where he said that the movie was very mediocre, bordering on bad in his opinion. And I guess to an extent I agree. I probably don't hate it as much as he did, but I mean, nah, it was a good review by the way. There was a lot of stuff that I agree with that was stated in that review. But um, well, let, let's just get on with it. So uh, the overall plot is basically Poseidon, who is the king of the sea here, not Neptune, Poseidon. Don't try to look into actual continuity with this movie and the rest of the series, because let me tell you, I was my brain was were scrambling trying to figure out when this takes place. Because it feels like this is supposed to be before the first movie, which they said was supposed to be the finale, and then there are points that feel like it's supposed to be after certain episodes, and that's that's neither here nor there. So Poseidon needs a snail because he's a very vain individual, and uh, he needs snails, um, snail trail that they make you know, on their stomachs whenever they slither around on the ground uh, for basically like a, a skin moisturizer. So... Plankton catches wind of this, and he kidnaps Gary to try and get rid of Spongebob, knowing that Spongebob will go looking for him, so that, that way he can just waltz in and, you know, uh, destroy the Krusty Krab without Spongebob there. So, there's that. And, uh, so from there, Spongebob and Patrick embark on a road trip to get Gary back, and eventually all of our other main characters go looking for them, because without Spongebob there, the Bikini Bottom is in ruins, specifically the Krusty Krab. And, uh, well, that's basically the plot. It's, it's a road trip movie, and then eventually they get to, not Atlantis, because, again, Atlantis was portrayed as both City of the Gods, and it was also portrayed as an alien society. Uh, no, it's the Lost City of Atlantic City, which is basically just a, it's basically just an underwater version of, like, Las Vegas. Um, so that's basically the general plot. Now, let's, let's break down some of the things that I kind of had a problem with. So, the first thing is, um, the plot is very much just a rehash of a bunch of different Spongebob plots put together. Um, the whole Plankton taking something and then putting it somewhere else really far away so that Spongebob has to go looking for it uh, and go on this quest, and then Plankton can just swoop in and do his dastardly deeds, that's obviously the first movie. You know, there's some differences in there. Then you got the whole Gary being snail napped or being gone and Spongebob goes looking for him, that's obviously, have you seen the snail? Uh, the Atlantis theme was kind of reminding me a little bit of Atlantis Square Pantis. Um, eventually when the gang goes looking for Spongebob and Patrick, that kind of reminded me of uh, Who Bob What Pants, especially with the whole scene of, you know, oh, the city is in ruins without Spongebob, the Krusty Krab is failing without Spongebob. That definitely reminded me of that. And there's just lots of that in this movie where it's like, man, I feel like we've done this already. One of the big things that was kind of irking me was the fact that one of the subplots we've got going on here is there is a whole side mission where SpongeBob and Patrick have a dream where they end up in this old western town with cowboy pirate zombies whose souls are trapped on Earth, and they need to be released because they're all under the oppressive thumb of some 
demonic cowboy played by Danny Trejo. Um, and yeah, this whole thing just kind of comes right out of nowhere. And they even keep pointing out, oh, it's a dream. It's a dream sequence. It's a, it's a fantasy. And it just feels like it comes and goes. Like the whole road trip aspect of this movie that they kind of build up near the beginning doesn't really go anywhere. It just kind of feels like, oh, well, they hit the road. Then they have this dream sequence, which goes on for a while. And, you know, they save the spirits by, you know, defeating evil Danny Trejo and they're all set free. And then, like, one other thing happens where they're, uh, they find out what's going on with Gary. And then, and then that's still when they're on the road. And then eventually they end up at uh, the lost city of Atlantic City. Like, that's it. The, the whole road trip aspect kind of feels like they just breeze through a lot of stuff. Yeah, like, at least in the first movie, right, there was a bunch of different, like, little set pieces. That's usually what a road trip movie should be. It, there should be, like, a bunch of different set pieces going on. You know, the first movie had the rednecks at the gas station, the thug tug, um, uh, the the chase with the, the frogfish, and then uh, the trench full of monsters, the first encounter with Dennis, um, you know, Shell City, and then them trying to make it back on David Hasselhoff. Like, it was a bunch of different, like, little set pieces that made up the overall road trip story of that film. Here, it's just kind of like, road trip, old west town fantasy, and then they just kind of get there. Like, <laughs> I, okay. And that whole old west thing, there's a dance number in it with Snoop Dogg for some reason, and it, that whole part just felt odd. It just felt like it came out of nowhere, and... The only thing I think that really accomplished was that it set up Keanu Reeves' character of uh, Sage, which is a magical, wise old Sage-type character that's also a tumbleweed that has Keanu Reeves inside of it. Um, and I feel like the only thing that that accomplished was... I mean, Keanu Reeves is probably one of the better things in the movie, easily. But uh, there's a whole thing that they also set up where SpongeBob's not very confident, and he... He's a little bit scared to go on the journey at first, and then eventually uh, he's not he's not convinced that they'll be able to do this, but then uh, Sage gives them a coin, which he says will come in handy during a very difficult challenge that'll help give them confidence. And eventually he admits, oh, the coin was bubkiss, I found it in a Cracker Jack box. He doesn't actually say that, but... Um, yeah, basically, he just admits that, you know, he just said it to try and help boost their morale, and you guys didn't need it. You had confidence the whole time. You had each other's backs. You know, you guys had confidence this whole time, and you didn't even realize it. And part, again, going back to the comparisons of the other movies, it reminded me of the first movie with the whole uh, fake mustaches thing. You know, uh, they think that they're not men, and then Mindy gives them the, the kelp mustaches, and they think, oh, they can do anything now, because, you know, now that we're men, that whole scene. But that was it just felt like they were rehashing that plot point. They could have easily established Keanu Reeves' character without even doing that whole Old West setting. They could have had it that they were driving and then their vehicle ran out of gas, they needed to walk up to a gas station that was a couple miles away, and then along the way they come across this tumbleweed, and he gives them the basic information. Um, you know, he's the old wise sage character, you know, or they find him on the outskirts. There's a scene where, you know, they're talking about being a little bit nervous going to, uh, the lost city of Atlantic city. And then they come across this tumbleweed while they're walking through the desert to get there or something like that. But no, like they have him outside this old West setting and that just kind of happens and that's it. Um, some people... One big debate that goes on about this movie is the soundtrack, and it the songs are good. They did pick a lot of really good trademark songs. I mean, you got Slow Ride, which was pretty cool, and um, then you got Livin' La Vida Loca, which is a catchy song, but it just felt, I don't know, like, compared to some of the other songs that were in the other movies, it felt a little bit odd. It's like, oh, we have copyrighted music going on now. And, I mean, just seeing Spongebob and Patrick singing along to, you know, the original Livin' La Vida Loca, that just was like, oh, okay. Um, oh, and there's two Weezer songs. Uh, they do the opening song, and then they do a cover of Take On Me for the, uh, you know, for the ending scene. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, the soundtrack, it's a little distracting, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad. I mean, most of the songs were at least good. You know, there wasn't any, like, you know, there was no 
terrible trap remix of the Adams Family theme, is all I'm saying. God, my family, family, family. God, no. That was awful. One thing I gotta bring up with this movie is the humor, and some of the jokes work, and other ones don't, at least to me. Uh, there's two jokes that stick out to me as being particularly just, like, what? Um... First of all, there's a part where they try to be self-aware, and, and Patrick's talking about how, oh, this is like one of those buddy movies. We go traveling on the road, and we're probably going to end up fighting at some point, and we don't like each other, but then we do like each other again, and we have to save the day, and yada yada. That's, yeah. That is, I don't know. Like Self-aware humor it feels like it can work, but whenever people try way too hard to do self-aware humor, sometimes it just comes off. Because I don't know. I can't really think of that many examples where Spongebob was that blatantly self-aware. Yes, there's obviously fourth wall jokes where they point out stuff like, you know, hey, if we're underwater, why is there fire? Or Spongebob's upside down in the in midair and he sees a mountain and since he's upside down, he goes, that's funny, someone put that mountain upside down and then he, you know, then camera spins around and he falls down. But seeing them blatantly point out like plot things like that just seems like it works for the most part in media like Deadpool or Rick and Morty because that was their established style of humor. Seeing Spongebob and friends, you know, point out cliches and tropes just feels a little bit weird. And there's another joke which, for all I know, maybe it's not a joke. Maybe it was just a blatant product placement. There's a part where uh, Sage is showing them what's going on with Gary and he does this with like um, uh, the, the window of Meanwhile which is a literal window frame that shows off what's going on with Gary and Poseidon. And uh, Patrick and Spongebob start freaking out and screaming, but obviously they're not getting any response because it's, as, as Keanu Reeves puts it, guys, it's not like Skype or FaceTime. And I was just like, seeing them like blatantly name drop actual products, that's just, that just felt weird. <laughs> I'm like, didn't expect that joke. Okay. Um... But there are some jokes that work. Uh, I'll say the one, one of the, the one joke that got me. Uh, okay, so there's a robot character in the movie that Sandy made, and basically it's um, a robot that's driving them around uh, throughout the entire film. And there's a part near the end where all the gang are trying to get away. They got Gary. They did a big song number to distract Poseidon and his audience. And so they're, as they run away. Um, uh, they need the getaway vehicle with the robot in it, Otto. They're like, Otto, take us back to Bikini Bottom! And before before they say that, the robot says he has a gambling problem. I don't know why that got me. I was just like, wasn't expecting to hear that. Oh, speaking of things wasn't expecting to hear, Spongebob says crappy in the movie. <laughs> He's like, Patrick's trying to make him feel better. It's like, you know, it's not the end, buddy. And then Spongebob's like, really? It does feel like it's the end. And crappy. I'm like, Wow. Well, I mean, after you drop freaking in uh, the first Spongebob movie, I guess anything goes. Spongebob saying crappy. There you go, audience. Um, so yeah, there were a few things that made me laugh. There were a few jokes that made me chuckle at most. That was the one about the robot gambling was the one real hard laugh I got. Then other times when they're trying to be self-aware, you know, they point out, oh, it's like one of those buddy movies. I'm like, okay. And then Spongebob, weirdly enough, Spongebob's character bounces through so many different emotions to where it's kind of odd. He, he goes from being, you know, the goober-like optimist that we all know, and then there's other parts where he's, you know, he's, they have this whole subplot of him being not confident and that he can't do anything, and then there's parts where he's just needlessly smug and condescending as a way to, I guess, introduce this whole subplot that him and Patrick are ang will be angry with each other later when they have the third act falling out. That just felt weird. Like, Patrick says the whole thing about, you know, oh, it's like a buddy movie, and we're eventually going to have a, a fight, and then we don't like each other, but then we do like each other, and we save the day. And then SpongeBob says, like, something about how he thought that it was going to be more of a, you know, a singular hero's journey where a single main character overcomes adversity. And it was just, the way he says it just makes him sound so smug, and I was like, where did that come from? Like, seriously, like, that just felt really out of nowhere. One thing I will say about the characters that I liked was uh, they actually used the other guys a little bit more. They actually used Mr. Krabs, Sandy, Squidward, Plankton a little bit more. I especially liked the fact that once the Krusty Krab starts failing, uh, Mr. Krabs feels so bad about SpongeBob being gone. So it's, he, as, as he literally puts it, it's 50% SpongeBob being gone and 50% about the money. Uh, it's like, well, you know what? 
considering that this is the same guy that fired SpongeBob over a nickel, you could say that that's progress for Mr. Krabs, I guess. Um, but I like the fact that Plankton, he gets the secret formula, and since Mr. Krabs doesn't, he's pretty much just given up at this point, and he's all sad. Plankton's like, he basically has this attitude of like, oh, come on, this isn't even fun anymore. Like, you're, you're just taking the fun out of it. Like, I can't even celebrate with you being all bummed out like that. I kind of liked that, because it's just like, wow, actual character development after all this time. <laughs> It's like, that's that's pretty rare with the newer episodes of Spongebob anyway. So, I did I, I did like that aspect of it. You might as well get the Camp Coral stuff out of the way. Whatever your thoughts are on Camp Coral, I just gotta say, in my opinion, it was the most crowbarred thing in this entire movie because it just feels so forced in comparison to the rest of the story that they have going. Like, okay, at the very beginning, they set up that Spongebob loves Gary, and they show that by showing... A flashback of how he met Gary at Camp Coral. And then later in the movie, Spongebob is on trial because he tries to get Gary back, but Poseidon uh, sends him and Patrick to the dungeon, and then they're going to be executed in front of, you know, a, a bunch of, a crowd of people. And you know, this is when uh, Mr. Crab, Squidward, Sandy, and Plankton show up to help save them. They basically do this whole trial situation, and they're like, let us defend him. And they go into these stories about how Spongebob made their lives better because he was so nice to them throughout all, all these years. And, oh, we even all met at summer camp. And then we get these, you know, these flashbacks where everyone met at Camp Coral. Now, uh, again, you can complain about the continuity, about how, you know, Spongebob didn't meet Sandy until much later. That was actually shown in, the like, one of the first few episodes about how him and Patrick met Sandy. Even taking that aspect out of it, this just felt so tacked on. This felt like the most, and that's kind of my, my biggest issue with the movie's tone, is that it definitely feels like the most corporate out of all the Spongebob movies. The first one was made because they genuinely wanted to do a, a big movie finale type of thing, because the original, the first movie was made to be a finale piece, but Nick said no to that. Um, and then the second movie was their attempt at trying to bring some life back to the show because uh, Steven Hillenburg was returning, so he was the one behind the second movie as well. Um, but this one, out of all of them, just that Camp Coral stuff, and then like you know the product placement and the soundtrack, it just feels a little bit like it feels more like a DreamWorks movie more than anything. It's like, oh look, we're hip and we got all the cool stuff. We got the self-aware humors. We got you know the celebrity cameos. We got the the Keanu Reeves and the and the Snoop Dogg, and it's it's just so. How do you do, fellow kids? That's kind of what it feels like. It feels like an attempt at trying to, you know, it's so much more corporate and like, oh, this is thing. These are things that people like, and we'll just put it in the movie. It's so back to our pilot. Like it really feels like even in the plot of the movie. The Camp Coral segments don't connect whatsoever. It's just such an attempt at them promoting something else that they were working on. And it just comes off like, man, that's cheap. <laughs> Even for Nickelodeon standards. I mean, Nick isn't really doing very well now, at least recently. You know, I mean, the only really big shows they have left are SpongeBob, which that's been going on since 1999. Um... You know, ever since they stopped doing Rugrats, which they're eventually going to bring back, and I, I saw, for anyone who's curious, I saw the teaser that they have for it. It looks all right. That might be good. Um, but, you know, the only things that Nick has left is SpongeBob, Loud House, and they have a bunch of other stuff that's just kind of off to the wayside. For a while, they had Ninja Turtles, but the 2012 show, that eventually ended. And the other show that they had of Turtles, they eventually, they eventually scrapped that because it wasn't doing very well. But now it just feels like Nickelodeon's like, why even bother having other shows? We can just we can just keep milking SpongeBob even more than we have already. It makes me think, do these people not learn from their other spinoffs? I mean, Planet Sheen and uh, All Grown Up, I mean, it wasn't my thing, but it was certainly better than the other time they tried doing a spinoff for Rugrats with uh, preschool days. But it's just like, it feels like, it just feels like desperate. It's just desperate corporate cynicism in a way. But that's, that's, that's a whole other subject. That's, that's more or less my, my criticisms towards Nickelodeon now. The movie itself, going back to the movie, uh, we might as well discuss the ending. So, uh, eventually, uh, Poseidon spills his heart out about why he's like this. And he said that he needs snails to, you know, help keep his skin 
moisturized and help him look young. And SpongeBob tells him that he doesn't really have any friends because he's so vain and nobody in his kingdom wants to be his friend. And then he reveals, you know, he's very insecure about how he is around people, but SpongeBob says that he'll be his friend. You know, he just needs to be himself and stop being so vain and worried about his appearance. And so from there, you know, Poseidon finally decides that he'll let SpongeBob keep Gary. And um, he, uh, oh, they also release all the snails that were in the dungeon because they established that once he's done with snails, he pretty much just enslaves them. He just drops them. Once they're just run dry of moisture, they just plop them on down to the dungeon uh, to do slave labor. But then eventually they free all the snails and the movie ends with everyone in Bikini Bottom now having a new pet snail. And um, it's set to Weezer's Take On Me. And uh, that's the film. Overall, like I said, it's not bad. It's just, in my opinion anyway, it's, it's just the weakest of the SpongeBob movies. Like I said, it just feels the most corporate. It feels like this one didn't have that much passion going into it. The plot definitely seems very recycled, and they just put a bunch of different elements of different SpongeBob things that we've already seen before into one movie. Um, if if you're a SpongeBob fan and you haven't seen it, then yes, obviously I'd recommend checking it out uh, and come to your own conclusions. I, this is the kind of movie, like, I can see people going one of two ways. People either like it or they won't like it. And me personally, I'm just like... Yeah, I think it's the weakest of the Spongebob movies, but it's not bad. I wouldn't say it's that bad of a movie. I just don't like it in comparison to the other two, at least not as much as I like. The first one I think is great, and the second one, while not as good as the first one, I think is... I still think the second one has a little bit more charm, because the second one I think is a little bit funnier than this one is. But that's just me. I mean, you know, yeah, some people are going to dislike it a lot more than me, and some people are going to like it a lot more than me. Um... And either way, that's that's up to you to decide. You, I, I would recommend people watch this movie and come to their own conclusion. And, yeah, feel free to tell me what you thought of this movie. Um, yeah, so like I said, it's not the worst thing ever, but in my opinion, it's my least favorite of the SpongeBob movies. It makes me curious how that original script they had for a SpongeBob movie would have looked, because apparently one of the alternate scripts they had was about these, like, cat alien creatures coming down and attacking Bikini Bottom. I'm very curious what that would have looked like. It would have been very weird, but I, I would say after this, it probably would have been at least a little bit more original than this was. Anyways, guys, what we have next on Media Wiz is more SpongeBob-related stuff. We have two SpongeBob live shows that I, I'm going to be doing full reviews for. We have um, the live show, one of the live shows they did at the Nick Hotel, and the other one is... Uh, from the UK, and it's a musical show based on the Sponge Who Could Fly episode. So that should be very interesting. Uh, but until then, guys, I'm the Media Wiz, because one art form wasn't enough. <laughs>